All right. Good morning, everyone. So we are now in a new chapter, chapter three, random variables. If you read the textbook, we have two chapters on random variables. This is uh, the chapter on discrete random variables. And then we have a chapter on continuous random variables, which is chapter four. Random variables, they are very useful. They're basically the object that we're going to study in this course. If you recall in lecture uh, 2.1 to 2.6, we talk about the basic principles of constructing probability space, and then we analyze two events, and then the relationship of them, conditional probabilities, uh, Bayes theorem, and things like that. Those events, I can describe them using words. Okay? And in many, many big problems, we can't just describe that, oh, Alex has a birthday something, and then John and it eats a burger. It, 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 it will be a lot more complicated than that. Imagine that you have an image, you have a million pixels, you want to construct a probabilistic description of that, how would you do it? So that lends to the topic of random variables. We want to define some kind of mathematical objects that can help us to quantify those situations. So what are random variables? Now you look at this name, random variable. Okay, that two words. What is a variable? Okay, very easy. X plus three equals to five, and then x is two. <laughs> okay, that's called a variable in the equation. That's a variable. There is nothing random. There's nothing random, so we call it a variable. Now, a thing is called a random variable when this variable has some randomness. Where does the randomness come from? I have a, a die, I throw the die, I have six numbers. Before I do the experiment, I don't know which one of the six numbers would come up. Okay? So, so, so there is a certain level of randomness going there. And so when you look at the die, from today onwards, you just think about this, hmm, this is not just a physical object that has six faces, but it has certain a probability distribution that has six states, one through six. And then uh, the state of one, you have certain probability of happening, state two, three, four, and six, uh, they have a different level of probabilities of happening. Now you may say, ah, a die should be a fair die, but, but I can't construct a die that is a little bit biased. Right? Then you have different levels of, of uh, probability of happening for different states. So when you look at the style, you should immediately think about it has six states. Each state has a value between zero and one. So that is a random variable. The random variable is, is, a, is a name. It's a name describing a mathematical object that has multiple states or infinitely many states. And each state has a probability of a happening. That should be the way of understanding the random variable. Okay, so let's get started about the, uh, to talk about the formal definition of a random variable. Now, first of all, why do we need random variable? Right? Throwing a die, that's so easy, uh, one through six. Why do we need to define a random variable? And here's the reason. Because mathematicians are lazy. Okay, you can read it with me, mathematicians are lazy. Okay, here's an example. You flip a coin. Okay, you flip a coin, you get a head or a tail, two states, very easy, right? Um, then when you write it down on the piece of paper, what you're going to write down is probability of getting a head. Uh, that's a pretty long sentence. Or if you want a shorthand notation, just write P of head. Whereas so you can say a P of tail. Okay, that's easy, that's easy, uh, it's not too bad. Um, and then let's flip three coins. Then you start to write head and head and head. Okay, 
Now, if you, if you say, okay, I, I want to uh, throw 10,000 uh, coins, then you're going to say, head and head and head and head and okay, whatever. That's just tedious. And mathematicians, they're lazy. I'm sorry, math, math people. Okay, they're just lazy. So what they're going to do is that I'm going to assign numbers to these events. Head would be one, tail would be zero. Now, you, you think that this is pretty obvious, right? One and then tail zero. But this mapping itself is already the process of defining a random variable. So what is a random variable? I tell you the event, I tell you the, the outcome of experiment, which is described by, by words. And then, and then you encode it by a number, zero or one. That mapping is a random variable. It, it, it is what the function of random variable, it is taking a, uh, a description into a number. Okay, so instead of saying head and head and head, you say, say one, one, one. A lot easier. So, in the abstract sense, what is a random variable? A random variable is a function, it's a mapping. It's a mapping. There are two things in this diagram. On the left hand side, you have the sample space. Inside the sample space, you have multiple events. A lot of these events. Uh, oh, they're the outcomes, not the event. The event will be the subset. There are a lot of uh, outcomes. For each of these outcomes, you're going to map them into a number on the real line. Now, this number on the real line doesn't need to be between 0 and 1. Uh, just think about you, you, you assign uh, excellent midterm performance equal to 100, uh, a terrible midterm performance to be 0. You are assigning uh, this event, you're assigning this outcome to a number on the scale between 0 and 100. So it doesn't need to be constrained to 0 and 1. Uh, by the way, midterm is coming in two weeks. Okay, it's on September 30th uh, in class. Uh, more announcements will come later. Okay, so, so let's go back to here. Um, uh, so you have a sample space, and on the right-hand side, you have this uh, real line. You have this real line. On this real line, of course, you have real numbers. And they could be integers. They could be just real, no real numbers. They could be negative numbers, uh, rational numbers. They could be some anything. So you're mapping these outcomes to this real line. And now note that uh, you have outcome psi 1, you, you, you marry it to a number. This number has to go through a function. It has to go through a mapping. Input is psi 1, the output would be a number, could be 0 0.2. Uh, that is called x. It's a function, it's a mapping. Applied it to this outcome psi 1, that assigns you a number, 0 0.2 or 0 0.5 or uh, 2.6. So that mapping, this eggs, okay, this eggs, this mapping is called the random variable. Now, this random variable doesn't need to be unique. Uh, in the following sense, you can map two to one. That's also allowed. I'm going to show you examples. Um, one quick example would be like the following. You, you, you flip the coin twice. I ask you, uh, X would define the sum of the conflict. Uh, head being one, uh, a tail being zero, I ask you the sum. Uh, then X would take one zero and zero one to the same number of one. Uh, uh, yeah, one, okay, right? Because zero plus one and one plus zero will give you one. Uh, and then if you, you, if you get one and one, then uh, the mapping will give you two. Right? So, so, so it doesn't need to be unique in the sense that not every outcome has to map to a different uh, a, a number on the real line. You can have uh, two outcomes that will be grouped together and then map to the same uh, real number. Just think about this, uh, flip the coin twice, uh, one zero and zero one. Uh, if you ask about the sum, it will be the same number of one, which is the sum of the two numbers. Okay, so that's a mapping, so we understand that. Um, the formal definition as follows. A random variable is a mapping uh, uh, from the uh, sample space to a real line that maps an outcome uh, psi in omega to a number x uh, on the real line. Uh, so uh, why the random variable? Uh, the random variables are functions. They, they just translate or encode the words uh, to numbers. So here's an example. You flip the coin 
uh, twice. The sample space will be uh, head and head, head and tail, tail and head, and tail, tail. So four uh, outcomes in this uh, sample space. The four events, psi one, two, and three, and four. And I define x being the number of heads. Then uh, x of psi one will give you two, psi two will give you one, uh, three will be giving you a one, and four will, will be giving you a zero. So you are, uh, um, you have four numbers, right, four outcomes. So this is side one, two, three, and four. And then you have a real line. Uh, you have uh, number zero, one, and two. And clearly, side one will be mapped to two. Side two and three will be mapped to one. And side and four will be mapped to zero. So you have two numbers mapped to the same outcome. Follow that? Because uh, uh, two and three, I'm just counting the number of heads. So the number of heads for this H and T, and T and H, they're both one. So I can map it to one. So that's a very easy example. Um, and then we can talk about calculating the probability. Uh, so how do you calculate the probability? Uh, it, uh, um, is this event x equal to 1 and event in the event space? Well, um, the event space, okay, so the event space, the event space doesn't live here. The event space actually lives inside the sample space. So let's think about the following question. What is the probability that x equals to 1? And how would, you do, how would you do that? Well, it's easy. Uh, two outcomes out of four, so it's two over four. Now, unconsciously, what, what you're doing is that you're not looking at this, uh, this line. You're looking at this line, and then you know in your head that there are two outcomes sitting on this x equals to one. Okay? Unconsciously, you, you know that, that, that there are two events here. So what that you're actually doing in your head is that you look at this real line, you take this one, you go back to the sample space. You just did it automatically in your head. You just, you just didn't realize. I give you one, x equals to one, right? I tell you, hey guys, x equals to one. Ask uh, what is the probability of getting x equals to one? Okay, so you go to here, and then you automatically go back to the sample space, and then you circle these two outcomes, side two and side three, because you know uh, one has to come from H and T and T and H, and therefore this is the, this is the uh, event inside the sample space, and therefore I measure the size of this event relative to the size of the sample space. I give you a number of two over four. You follow that? Okay, so, so, so it's a little bit complicated in the following sense. There is a mathematician that really hates dealing with the word H and T for whatever reason. So he or she translated this process to numbers between 0, 1, and 2. Okay, just translated that. When you look at a problem, when you need to calculate the probability, you need to go back to the original sample space. So you need to do a little bit of decoding, back to the original sample space and compute the event over there and compute the probability over there. And so, as you look at how do we define the probability of a random variable, what do we expect? You should expect to see some kind of inverse mapping. Okay, you should expect to see some kind of inverse mapping because what is the probability of getting x equals to one? This is equals to the probability of having h and t and t and h. Okay, so by just looking at this, a thing here, I don't know the probability. I'm, I'm taking a translation, an inverse translation, back to the sample space and list out these two events, and I compute the size of these two events. See, that it's a little bit complicated, but, but that's the logic, the logic, okay? So, um, then what it means to us is the following. <coughs> Uh, definition, the inverse mapping definition. So let's consider this event A. In the previous example, it would be one, okay, the number one. You have a number A, and then I ask, can you calculate the probability of x equals to A? 
right? How do we do that? Well, unconsciously, we are doing this, uh, psi 1 and psi 2. So there is a process. There's a process. The process is that we're looking at this inverse mapping. When I give you the A, you're going to take the inverse mapping X inverse. Then you're going to get back the psi 1 and psi 2, which is set inside the sample space. So uh, this is a set. This is an important thing. The, psi in, the X inverse is a set. It is an event in the event space. And you can measure an event using P, but you cannot measure the event in the translated space. So it means that you cannot do the measure here. You have to do the measure over there. I hope that makes things clear. OK, so let's look at this uh, example. Let's look at this example. You, uh, you flip the coin twice. You flip the coin twice. Uh, the, uh, the, the sample space is, is this, right? H, 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 T, T, H, and T, T. Uh, and then you calculate uh, x being the sum of uh, the, the heads. Uh, what is the sample space? The sample space for this problem will just be this. The sample space contains four configurations. What is the x? The x would take uh, all these sides to a number between 0 and 1. So if you take h, h, it's going to give you uh, 2. If you take uh, h, t, that's going to give you 1. You take a th, that's going to give you 1. And if you take h and h, uh, and t, t and t, that's going to give you a 0. So what is a? The a will be 2 and 1 and 0. What is this x inverse a? What depends on what a you have. So if your a is 0, then x inverse will give you t and t. Uh, if your a is 1, if you apply the inverse, you're going to get uh, h and t and a t and h. So you have two uh, events. Uh, and then if you look at a 2, uh, then x inverse will give you this uh, event of uh, head and head. And what are the elements we need to count? Well, you have, you have 1, 2, 3, and 4. You have four elements that you need to count. Okay, consider another exa example. Now, uh, this time, let's throw a die uh, twice. Let's throw a die twice. Then you have 36 outcomes. The, uh, they are side 1 to uh, side 36. X is the sum of two numbers. Uh, what is the probability of getting a, a 7? So, again, we can talk about what is a sample space. This is the Sample space, what is the x? The x is a sum of the two numbers, so, so you're going to take x. If you apply it to psi 1, which is 1 and 1, you're going to assign it to 2. Uh, and, and you can, of course, do the similar things for the other numbers. Uh, inversion is that if I give you uh, a 2, I take the inverse, it has to give me back 1 and 1. But if I take... Um, uh, 36, I take the inverse, it got to give me a 6 and uh, sum, right? Oh, it's, it, it couldn't be 36, it should be 12. Uh, it, it will be 6, 6 and 6. Now, if I say, what is 7? Then, then uh, the inversion of 7 has to be uh, a 1, 6, a 2, 5, all the way to a 6, 1. So you have uh, 6 configurations that can give you the, the 7. So whenever you, I give you 7, you go backward, and then you find out the, uh, the, the, the outcomes that lead to this 7. So I hope these two examples give you an idea of the forward mapping and also the backward mapping. Uh, of course, if you're familiar with all these concepts, you don't have to think every time of this process. You, you just automatically do it in your brain. Uh, OK, uh, 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 7, OK, well, well, these are the cases. But I'm just mentioning the, these are the fundamental and the underlying principles that, that well defines this process. Otherwise, when you just think about, oh, the real line, it, it may not work. Okay? You need to go backward into the sample space and calculate all these probabilities. 
So to summarize a little bit here, a random variable is a function, as I keep mentioning, and then uh, it, it, th there's an inverse mapping here. Just remember there's a reinverse mapping that takes this translation backward and measure in the original sample space, then you can calculate the probability. Okay, very abstract uh, uh, introduction. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, what are the elements that we need to count? You need to count over here. You still need to count in the sample space. There are, 30, there are 36 elements you need to count. Um, and so let's say if you look at this and uh, getting a seven, you still need to count over here. You, you never count on the real line between two and 12, right? It, because I'm talking about um, the sum of two numbers. So, the, so the, um, the numbers that you're looking at will be from two to 12, so from two to 12. And then underlying this experiment, you have 36 outcomes. So you still count inside the 36 element sample space. The pairwise numbers. Okay. Now, of course, if you say that, hey, um, I have a, uh, I do the experiment. I don't tell you what I have done. It start with from two to twelve, and then each one they have a different probability of happening. I don't even tell you what what is underlying that 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 process through the two die. I don't tell you any of those. Then, of course, the sample space would be constructed from two to twelve. Okay, because I don't know, oh, you, you actually throw a die or you just uh, uh, do some other ex experiments, who knows, right? Uh, you, you come to me immediately saying that, okay, here is the sample space that contains uh, numbers from 12, uh, 2 to 12, and then they have different probabilities of happening. If you come to me with this context, then the sample space will be from 2 to 12, and then each one will have a different, different probability. Uh, whereas if you come to me and say that I threw the dice twice, oh, then I have to go back all the way back to here and then define the sample space according to the experiment that you're describing. You see the difference? Okay. Question, yes. Yeah, what is A? That's an excellent question. What is A? Um, the A here is a dummy variable. And in this example, this A is the number seven. Okay, so remember that I have this uh, sample space, and then I have a number on the real line. This is the real line. Now think about this example of throwing a die, yeah, throw a die, and then throw a die twice. Uh, if you throw a die twice, I'm gonna get you a number uh, between two to 12, and I'm asking, okay, what's uh, number seven? Seven, okay? So I say A equals to seven. That is just a dummy variable. Now, you don't like seven, you like two, you can do two, okay? You like 11, you can do 11. You like 13, no, you cannot do 13 because I'm throwing a dice twice, okay? Uh, so, so they say, okay, I'm looking at this number seven. You know, mathematicians, they like symbols, so just call A equals to seven. And then you ask, oh, okay, let's go backward. What are the possible uh, outcomes that can lead you to the seven? Then you go to here, you look at, oh, three, four, uh, five, two, uh, six, one, uh, one, six, uh, a few of them, you say, ah, okay, this subset will lead you to this number A, which is seven. So you say, X applied to uh, this set here, um, any of those, uh, that will give you this uh, uh, A, which is seven. Does that make sense? So this A is a dummy variable. Other questions? Is it clear? Okay. Now, let's move on. So this is the abstract definition of a random variable. Of course, we're not gonna use that, just like the axioms. Once you know the axioms, you're not gonna do your machine learning training using the axioms, right? So same case here. Although we know the existence of these random variable, we know the formal definitions, we're not gonna use them to do calculation. Okay, so how do we do the actual calculation computation on computers? We start with the thing called the probability mass function. Okay, so what is this? Probability mass function is histogram. Okay, don't be fooled by all these complicated names. Just histogram. Now, you know histogram. I like using the, the test as an example. You plot the, the score of the students, and then you see 
Usually, uh, in 302, you'll be two bumps, okay? Uh, two Gaussians, boop, boop, okay? Uh, now, um, uh, so, so that is, uh, now if you have 100 students, 200 students, uh, those are pretty good uh, distributions. Uh, um, and so what are histograms? They tell you uh, how many people will get the score of 72. Basically, that's the meaning. Um, now, probability mass functions are not exactly the same as a histogram. So I would just say approximately equal to uh, a histogram. There's a difference. There's a difference. The key difference is that histograms are random. Probability mass functions, they are not random. Oh, that's very counterintuitive because this, this name has a word probability. It sounds really random. I have been playing Excel spreadsheets forever, and I have never seen anything random about the histogram. Why are you saying that this is random? Um, oh, by the way, we should tell the first year engineering, uh, don't, don't teach Excel anymore. Uh, OK, it's just, just not allowed. The, 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 the starting point has to be Python, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So please write this feedback to first year engineering at Purdue. Okay, uh, everything you need to know about a random variable, I guess we are already familiar with this. So now let's talk about this probability mass function. What is it? It is just very, very trivial. It's this. Probability that x equals to a. a is a dummy variable. So think about this. You have a random variable discrete case, right? Discrete case, you have a finite set of states. Uh, one through a hundred for your test score, uh, including zero, that happened. Uh, so so uh, a score from zero to a hundred, or through a die from one to six, um, these are your eight. These are your eight. And you ask, what is the probability of getting x equals to a? That has to be a number between zero and one. You assign that number, and you plot it out. That is called the probability mass function. It, it, it looks very simple. Uh, so let's say you have one, uh, uh, zero, uh, let's call it one, two, three, four, five, six, for a uh, Fourier die. Uh, and we all know that it would be something like this. Okay, each one is one over six. Then the probability of x equals to one, you will get one over six. Equals to two, you get one over six. And we can define this as a, uh, as a more shorthand notation. It will be probability of x of one, probability x of two, all the way through probability x of six. You can assign the number to these six states. And you say, this is one over six, this is one over six, this is one over six. And just that's a very simple assignment of probability. Now, uh, depending on what kind of die you have, you have an unfair die, you can assign different numbers. As long as they sum to one, you're good. Okay, so there are two things, right? So there is a random variable, x, and then there is a dummy variable, a. This x is called the random variable. This a is called a state. Okay, so don't, don't, don't mess these two up. One is called a random variable, the other one is called a state. Sometimes when we read textbook, you see Big X and small x, big X refers to the random variable, small x refers to the state. Two different things. Okay? State is one of the many possible states. X is a random variable. A random variable has a distribution. A state is a scalar. Okay, one of the many states. Preview example, um, you have uh, a coin through, uh, 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 flip it twice, you count x being the number of heads, uh, then you can assign this uh, px of 0, px1, px2 equals to 1, 4, 1, half, 1, 4. These are the probabilities that you can assign to this um, uh, uh, random variable. So when you plot it out, you have these uh, three uh, delta functions. We call it a discrete random variable, and so they're all described by the delta functions at different uh, states. So the difference between a variable and a random variable, uh, this is an a, a, a equation, 2x plus a equals to 0. If you look at an ordinary variable, it's just an equation. A random variable, um, you can have different possible, um, 
why do I have in this one? That should only be there should only be one equation, still be the one equation. Okay. Oh, okay. So here I get it. So so there's an A here. A is a random number. Okay. A is the part, A is a fixed. Okay, A is fixed, but then you can have multiple states of the A. So you think about the summary variable, you have A being zero or one or two, or if you throw a die, you get one and two and three and four and six, okay? So you get all these numbers. So depending on what kind of A you plug it in, uh, you have different equations, and so therefore you have different solutions. And therefore this X, you have different randomness uh, associated with it. Okay, so uh, in this, in the ordinary equation, you only have one variable. Okay, it's fixed, it's deterministic. There's only one. In the random variable case, depending on what a you have, uh, you will have a different outcome for the x. And so you have different um, probability mass uh, for the x. So you can say, okay, what is the uh, um, what is the probability of getting this uh, state x? They're all one third, and then uh, you have three choices. One half, zero, and minus one half for this equation. So let's look at the histogram. This is a bit more interesting. Here is a histogram I downloaded from, no, not downloaded, I, I made it up from the Wikipedia. So this is the uh, 26 uh, English alphabets uh, from A to Z. And uh, they are the probability of happening. So if you read a, a, a book, you pick a word, what is the probability that you're going to get an X? What is the probability of getting an E? Uh, so this is a histogram um, uh, constructed from um, many, many, many books, according to Wikipedia. So you can see here, an E, of course, you have a much higher probability of happening. Uh, the other one will be A and T. T actually happens more often uh, than, than, than I. Uh, interesting. Okay. So this is a histogram. This is a histogram. Um, but this histogram um, is not quite the same as the following histogram. You, let's say you throw a die um, 10 times. Okay, you throw a die 10 times. Um, you throw a die 10 times and then you record the, the number. It could be 1 to 6. Um, if, if, if the number is 1, you, you, you plot a 1. Okay, you, you go to the bin of 1, you, you add a ball. Okay, and then you start to build a histogram. How will the histogram look like when you have only 10 dies to throw. Will you, will you, do you think you're going to get an equal distribution for everyone? No. Why? Why? You see the question? So you, you, have, you set 10 dies, throw them, you plot the histogram, and you all agree that you're not going to get a first flat. Uh, one six, one six, one six, one six, one six. What do you get? Yeah? Not even there, you just get some crap. Okay? You just get some crap. Just, how, many, how many dies do you have? Ten. And how many states are you looking for? Six. There's a lot of states relative to the number of, of, of experiments that you, are, you have run. Now, what happens if you, th if you have a million dies. What do you expect the histogram to look like? Yeah. Normal distribution? Uh, you only have six dies, so you, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, uh, no, I'm not adding them. I'm, ju I'm just counting, okay? What, what do you expect to get? Flat, okay, a million. Actually, it's not flat yet. Not flat yet. Almost. Almost flat. Do you guys follow? Okay, you have a million dice, you just throw them, and then you count uh, the number of ones, and then you put it into the bin. You start to do this experiment. Um, and then you, you, you start to look at the, the shape of the, 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 the bin. It gradually, gradually becomes flat, but not exactly flat yet, because you can, you can always go to the 10th decimal place 
and see if they're all the same. They're not the same yet. Then you can ask, how will I get equal? Well, keep doing it. 10 million, a billion, 10 billion, just keep doing it. Then you'll get them closer and closer to this flat thing. So um, going back to this histogram here, do you think that this histogram, according to Wikipedia, is this a limiting object that people have constructed, or is it just um, some finite sample thing that people have constructed from reading a couple of books? It got to be finite, okay? So it got to be finite. So what it means is that today I do experiment. I read all these um, a thousand books. I come up with this histogram. Tomorrow, I invite another person in this classroom. I ask you to read another 1,000 books. You're going to come up with another histogram. The histogram I have here will likely be different from the histogram that you're going to construct tomorrow. Although the shape will be, OK, they should be more or less the same. But then, exactly the numbers will not be the same. You see that, that the difference? OK. Histograms, they are random because I do the experiment, I do the set of experiments, I plot the histogram, this is the empirical thing I can do. And so my histogram will be different from your histogram. We will become the same um, if we do the experiment million and million and million, technically it should be uh, infinitely many times, then my histogram will be the same as your histogram. And when that happens, you are not the histogram anymore, I'm not a histogram anymore. I will become the probability mass function. Okay? Histogram and probability mass functions, they are different things. They're different in the sense that histograms, they are constructed from a finite set of samples. Probability mass functions, they are, they are the limiting objects of all these histograms. Okay, so here is an illustration of the die, uh, the die throwing experiment I just described. You have uh, 100, 1,000, uh, 10,000, you can do 10 million. Uh, even when you have 10,000, you are not flat. And this is the true um, probability mass function. It's all flat. So you can see that there is a, there is a convergence to this thing. Okay, <clears throat> so why do we study the probability mass function? Why can't we just study the histogram? Once you understand the randomness of the histogram, you will start to appreciate the probability mass function. If the histograms, they are all random, then why should I use your histogram, but not my histogram? You will run into all these kind of questions. And also, when you, when you try to think about from the, from, from the modeling perspective, okay, from the modeling perspective, I do this experiment, I look at the, the histogram. This is an empirical thing. You have some, some randomness over here. And then I ask, how do you fit the data? What, what, how do you describe the data? You're going to go into textbooks, and then you're going to find out different distributions. You're going to fit them. The moment you start to go to textbook and find out a distribution trying to fit them, that, that distribution would be the probability mass function. Or in a continuous case, we call it the density function. They're the limiting things that can help you fit the real data. Okay? So, so there, are, there, are the two, there are two paths. One is the forward path where you want to synthesize data. In machine learning, in machine learning this is very often. Okay? I have... Um, I have certain events, uh, scientific events. Uh, I, for example, I, um, I want, in my research, I want to model the atmospheric turbulence, and this is a random event. How do I do that? Uh, well, I can, of course, go outdoor and collect data, but this is tedious. On the other hand, I can also go to my simulator. I can simulate these events. So this forward process, how do you do the forward process? Well, I need to know the probability density function or the probability mass function for discrete events. And then in random processes, we have a thing called the, uh, the, 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 uh, the power spectral density, which we will learn that later. So, so you start with all these mathematical objects. You, you, you draw, you synthesize the samples. 
So that's a forward process that can help you generate a lot of data to train a machine learning model. So that's a forward process. The backward process is also important. I, I, I'm doing data mining problems. Uh, my boss hands some data to me. Uh, it could be some diabetes data. Uh, and then I look at the data. I need to summarize them. I need to come up with a model. I want to describe them. That is the question of going back and ask which PMF, probability mass function to use, which density function to use, model selection question, parameter estimation question. So it's the inverse problem, right? So you can see that there are two paths, forward and then backward. They're both important. And in any case, you can't just rely on the empirical histogram. It doesn't work. You, you've got to go back, have this generative model, uh, starting from the mathematics, starting from the statistical models, and then you look at what is the relationship between and them, and then you come up with this model selection and then parameter estimation. So that's very important. This probability mass function is just not one object that we, we ask you to study. It's actually very, very useful. There are certain prob prob um, properties of the probability mass function. The first one being very obvious, that if you sum over all the possible states in your sample space, you're going to get one. Now, I don't have to explain or prove anything. It's just that your sample space has to sum to one. That's, that's the axiom. If I, if I, if I um, count every possible outcome in the sample space, because of the third uh, axiom, I'm taking the union of everyone. I can just sum everyone individually. It should sum to one. Okay, so that should be the case. Now, let me give you an example just to uh, uh, do a very uh, little warm up of this ex exercise. Um, so, example one, you have a random variable with this probability mass function. Uh, it has an equation px of k equals to 1 over 2 uh, to the power k. There's a constant c outside. Um, so there are a couple of notations here. This x is the random variable, rv, that denotes um, the object that we are studying. There is a k, this is the state. This is a dummy variable that I'm, I'm going to define. Uh, this k equals to 1, 2, 3, all the way to uh, uh, infinity. So this is a k. There is a, a constant c, which is the constant I care, I want to find out. So I ask, uh, if this is the probability mass function for k equals to 1 to infinity, what is c? We know uh, it's pretty easy to calculate. Just sum everyone, make it to 1, find out the c. Does that make sense? Right? Because uh, it, to find the c, I just need to know the, prob uh, the summation of all this x over the possible case, k going from 1 to infinity, has to be 1. And then the rest is algebra. So you plug in uh, sum of uh, c can come out 1 over 2 to the power k, uh, k going from 1 to infinity. That should be 1. Right? And so how do I do that? There's a c. This is just 1 half plus 1 fourth plus dot, dot, dot. That has to give me 1. So what is that solution? Ah, that's very easy. There's a, there's a geometric series, so you have c over 2, so you have 1 plus 1 over 2 plus dot, 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 that equals to 1. And so uh, then you have c over 2 of 1 over 1 minus 1 half, that equals to 0. That equals to 1. And then, um, then c over 2, this should give you 2 equals to 1, so c equals to 1. Right? So the rest is just algebra. It's not interesting. Okay? The, the interesting part is the beginning. I give you this PMF, and then I ask you to calculate this constant C. And you set up this equation using the property. Uh, very straightforward. Let's work on another example just to make sure that everyone follows. Uh, uh, here, here is the uh, random variable x, and then here is the probability mass function uh, C times psi of pi over 2 times k. And k is 0, 1, 2, all the way to infinity, and find c. OK, so what is c? Let's just do it, OK? So 
I have I will plot it out right side pi over two times k. So when k is one, uh, you get you get a uh, one, and then when k is two, you get zero. When k is three, you get minus one, and then zero and one and zero minus one and so on. Okay, so this is this is the value of that. So you want to make sure that this p x of k uh, equals to one, k going from zero to infinity, and so that means you have this. Um, uh, there's a C here, C, um, 0 plus 1 plus 0 plus uh, minus 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 0 plus minus 1 plus dot dot dot, uh, that has to equal to 1. What is C? What is C? Yeah? Is, so one suggestion is C is zero. Okay, so yes. Undefined, why is it undefined? Yeah, this is not a problem, okay? This is a problem I just make it up to trick you because you have this. How can you get a probability of a negative value that's not allowed by SM number one? Okay, this problem is just wrong. The problem is wrong. You, you, you cannot have this problem. Okay, so the answer is that uh, undefined or wrong problem. Uh, so don't say that C is infinity or C is one. Just because uh, all the probability has to be positive, at least non-negative. You cannot have negative probabilities. All right. So um, before I uh, finish this lecture, I want to um, comment on one more thing, which is the computing thing. Computing thing. Now, uh, in homework number two, we have assignment of uh, uh, throwing a die. And then, uh, and then counting the number, counting the sum, and then plotting the histogram, I make a, a, a very specific instruction that you cannot use a for loop. Okay? And I know in this class, a lot of people are, uh, want, to, want to hate me, okay? which, is, which is fine. And, and let me tell you how do we do that. Um, do you want MATLAB or do you want Python? Python, Python. okay, let's do Python. Okay, so Python will be rent int. <laughs> okay, uh, rent int. And for Python, you can of course, if, because you're throwing a die, you're throwing a die, right? Uh, die will be uh, from, from one to six. Okay, good, all right. And then you type size equals to something. Size equals to something. Okay, so now, now think about this experiment. Let's say we want to throw, give me a number, throw a die. Um, how many times? 10 times? Okay, 10 times. And then, and then we're gonna sum. Okay, uh, 10 times we're gonna sum. And then uh, how many experiments do you want to run? How many experiments? Right, t t 10 times, right? So that's called one experiment. How many experiments do you want to run? Uh, more, more, more. In, how about 2,000? Okay, 2,000 times. 2,000 times. 2,000 times, and then uh, each time I throw 10 dice. You run this, what do you get? You just call this command, what do you get? You're going to get an array of 2,000 rows and then 10 columns. Each row will be a number, uh, six, two, one, one, two, five. It will be a number between one and six. This is called one experiment, and you can sum them by using the sum command in Python, mp.sum. You can get this column. Okay, just sum the rows, you can get this column. And the sum can be done uh, on this array. You don't, you don't need to write a for loop. Just construct this array, call the sum, you can get this, uh, the, the, the array of the sum of the numbers. 
plot the histogram of this one. Problem solved. There's no need to write loop one, two, three, four, five, two thousand times. Each time you loop one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to a ten. You don't have to do that. Just call this command once, sum, plot, period. Problem solved. Okay? Plot the, plot the diagram, submit the homework, and you get the points. It's that easy. Okay? This technique is called the vectorization in Python and MATLAB. You should learn it. This is very useful. Alright, so I will stop at this point and then I'll see you next time.